turn to Luke's Gospel, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, page 1708. Some of the parting words of the Lord Jesus before he ascended. Speaking to his disciples. Luke 24, and reading from verse 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. And you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Acts chapter 1, Acts and chapter 1, page 1763, and reading verses 7 and 8, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Acts chapter 2. And reading from verse 37, Acts 2, 37, the day of Pentecost, and Peter is preaching. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. <clears throat> Peter has just charged them with crucifying the Messiah. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. The promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise that we will be clothed from heaven, clothed in power by the Holy Spirit, is for who? It is for you, it is for your children, and for all who the Lord will call to himself. Who's it for? Everyone. <clears throat> Is there an age limit? No. If you can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you can be born of the Spirit of God, you can be clothed with the power of God. It is the promise of the Father to all to all turn to first corinthians and chapter 14 
1 Corinthians 14, page 18, 65. Chapter 13 is the great chapter. You seem to reserve for weddings, but it's the chapter on love. Am I told? Now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Pursue love. We should pursue love. Yet, desire earnestly, eagerly desire, what? The spiritual. We should eagerly desire, we should covet the spiritual, especially that you may prophesy. We are commanded to covet the spiritual. It should be in the heart of all of us, that we want more of the Holy Spirit. We should cover being filled with the Holy Spirit. We should cover being clothed, being empowered with the Holy Spirit. All of us. We should pursue love, but we should cover it. We should earnestly desire the Spirit of God. Why? Because He's God. He is the third person of the Godhead. He is God. If we have a hunger, if we have a thirst for God, we should eagerly desire more of the Holy Spirit. To be filled with Him, to be clothed with Him, to be empowered by Him. He is God. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so our soul should long after God, after the living God. We should be longing for more of the presence and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, constantly. It should be our eager desire. We're not to covet anything else, but we are to covet God. Of all the things that you might want, of all the things that you might have on your shopping list, God says you should cross them all off and you should put one thing there. Him. The presence, the filling, and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Why? Why? And what difference should it make in our lives and in the church? That's what I want to think about a little bit this morning. Turn on further in the chapter down to verse 23. I've been speaking about some of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit and particularly addressing the issue of tongues speaking with <coughs> different languages <coughs> by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And verse 23, he says, If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say, you're all mad? What well, dear friends, they do they do. That's the truth of it. There are people who go along to Pentecostal churches, churches where it is the practice to speak in tongues for all the congregation, to pray in tongues where there's just a free-for-all, almost. And the ungifted or unsaved come in among them and they will say what? These people are crazy. This is just balmy. But, if all prophesy, 
and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. If the Spirit of God is moving among us, dear friends, if God is meeting with His people, and the Holy Spirit is leading our worship, and enabling people to speak by the enabling of the Holy Spirit in a language that people can understand. God can speak to men's hearts. <coughs> God can lead us in such a way that people read scriptures or there'll be hymns or whatever that will speak directly to people's hearts. And people will say, God is among these people. There's something real about this. God is among these people. We should cover that, dear friends. Because what marks us out from any other group on the face of this earth? Is it that we have a better set of rules? Well, we do. We have the very oracles of God. The law of the Lord is perfect. Is it just that we have prophecy? Well, we have prophecy. God has revealed from beginning to end all the important events for the history of man. And what he will do before Jesus comes back. And he's entrusted them to us. And we should make them known. And they should awaken unbelievers. But what marks us out, dear friends, different from any other group of people, it should be the very life of the Holy Spirit. We are a people whom God is with and in. He is Emmanuel, God with us. We should be marked out by spiritual life, dear friends, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, <coughs> The Word of God is superior, far superior from any other philosophy or belief. It is the truth. It is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But we should cover the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that people should look at us and say there is something different about these people. God is truly among them. And we should cover that. We should cover that for ourselves as individuals. We should cover that for our, our, our congregation as we gather together that this would be a place where God meets with us, where the Spirit of God is moving and manifesting in different ways and leading us in different ways so that if someone comes in, they will have to say, God's in this place. It's an awesome place. It is the house of God. Isn't that what Jacob said? This is an awesome place. He called it Bethel. It's, it's the very house of God. God has met with me here. Well, dear friends, God should be meeting with us. Week by week, the Spirit of God should be moving among us. Week by week, and we are to covet that. That even if unbelievers, even if someone who, who doesn't know anything of that comes in here, they will have to say, God's in this place. God is among these people. There's something real. And we are commanded to cover that.
I want to look at one or two things. Without the Holy Spirit, what is the church? Without the Holy Spirit, what goes wrong? Let's look at one or two things. Turn to John and chapter 16. John's Gospel and chapter 16. I can perfectly understand when we look around, when we see some of the wrong things that are being paraded as being a work of the Holy Spirit, why people would be wary, why people would hold back, would be uh, rather cautious about seeking the power of the Holy Spirit. Because there's some pretty crazy things being done in the name of Pentecostalism and, and charismatic churches. Things that are blatantly false. But that shouldn't stop us seeking that which is real. Because it is the promise of the Father. Jesus did say, you shall be empowered. You shall be clothed with power from high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. He did say that. John chapter 16 and verse 8. And he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. What will he do, the Holy Spirit? He will convict. He will convict unbelievers of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. We need him to, don't we? Without the Holy Spirit, dear friends, outreach becomes a series of complex arguments and apologetics. We're desperately trying to convince somebody of something that the Bible says they know already, that there is a God. But he, the Holy Spirit, convicts of sin. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached the gospel, and the Holy Spirit came with power and authority upon him, the Holy Spirit convicted men and pierced their hearts. Don't we need that? Oh yes we do. And without it, we can do nothing. Without him, without the working of the Holy Spirit, no one can be saved. No sinner can be awakened. No one can hear the voice of God. Without the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we can be as eloquent as we like. We can be as convincing as we like. But without the Holy Spirit, it's nothing. The flesh, dear friends, profits nothing. The Spirit brings life. And the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We need Him. Jesus said, you need Him. You are to wait for power from on high that you might be my witnesses. That you might go to the very end of the earth and proclaim that people should repent because God has fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. And the Holy Spirit will convict men of sin, will convict men of righteousness, will convict men of judgment. Who'll do it? The Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Dear friends, the Holy Spirit doesn't come 
or marketplaces. He doesn't fall on streets. The Holy Spirit comes upon His people. The people of God. The Holy Spirit clothes those who know Jesus. That is the promise of the Father. And we need it. Because without Him we are left trying to devise gimmicks and schemes and programs to cajole people into the kingdom of God. And it doesn't work. It does not work. Whatever it is, it doesn't work. But he works. He works. Turn to the book of Revelation and chapter 3. Do we need to repent? That's an Old Testament thing, repent. All men need to repent, dear friends. <coughs> do we need to go on repenting? Yes, we do. We repent and believe the gospel and we go on repenting. Why? Because repentance means a change of mind. And we need to be continually changed in our thinking. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds, aren't we? To be conformed to the image of God's Son. To start thinking the way that God thinks. And so there's an ongoing work of repentance. And God calls five of the seven churches in Revelation to repent. Don't know what percentage that is, five-sevenths, but it's a good number, isn't it? It's a good chunk of the church. It's a, it's a fair amount of God's people that need have some repenting to do. We do need to repent. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds... You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. You're dead. You've got a name, people think you're alive, but actually, you're dead. We can be dead, dear friends. We can be spiritually lifeless without the Holy Spirit. We need Him. Otherwise, we can have a name, we can have a million and one church programs, we can appear to be doing all kinds of things, but without the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we're dead. We can have a name, a reputation, we can have anything, but without the Holy Spirit, we're dead. We need it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Page 1910. Ephesians and chapter 5. Reading from verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine. That is dissipation. Why shouldn't we get drunk? Why shouldn't we drink? Why is God so bothered about that? We should be controlled, we should be filled with, not with drink. He wants us to be influenced. He wants us to be moved. He wants us to be stirred. He wants us to be affected by the Holy Spirit. Why do people drink? It's a good question, isn't it? Why do people drink? 
primarily to deaden their conscience. I'm fully convinced that that's the purpose of alcohol. It deadens a person's conscience. Before I was saved, I couldn't sleep without drink. I couldn't sleep on a night, because praise God, my conscience was still alive. And I had, I had to drown it every day, so that I could sleep on a night. Because I was living like the devil. And I had to drown my conscience so that it wouldn't bother me. I had to drink. I had to be drunk so that I could do the things that the lusts of my flesh were driving me to do. Because my conscience would not allow me to do it sober. And so I would drink. People drink to celebrate. It's a substitute, dear friends, of the Holy Spirit. Who will lead us in the right way. Who will cause us to do the right things. Something good's happened. Oh, let's all go get drunk. No, dear friends, what should we do? We should gather before God and we should praise Him and we should give Him honour and glory for what He's done. We should thank Him. We should praise Him. So don't get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Admonishing one another and in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, we will overflow with thanksgiving and praise. And isn't that what we should be doing? Amen. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so we don't need a ten-piece band to worship, whip up the worship. We need the Holy Spirit. We need Him to move upon our hearts so that we are overflowing with thanksgiving and with praise. I'm not against music. Don't get me wrong on that one, please. I don't, oh, Chris Brough doesn't like music in the church. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that those things can be a substitute for the Holy Spirit. They can. Oh, well, let's play this one and then we'll play that one and that gets everybody in the mood. They'll all be waving their hands before we know what's happening. And we'll, have, we'll sing that through six times. It usually whips people up. They'll be waving their hands and it gets people in the mood. Well, it, it doesn't, dear friends. Well, it might. But it won't be spiritual. Do you understand? It will be a substitute for what? The Holy Spirit. What do we need? We need the Holy Spirit. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, He will touch our hearts, He will move our hearts, and we will overflow with thanksgiving, with praise, we will want to honour Him, we will want to glorify Him, and if we don't, dear friends, then face the reality, you might have a name, but you're dead. If you don't want to praise Him today, if there's not something which is overflowing from your heart of worship to God, then you might have a name that you're alive, but admit it, you're dead. And what do you need? Holy Spirit, you need Him to come and to fill you afresh, that you might overflow. Don't be filled with wine, and don't choose something else as a substitute. Go and seek God, that you might be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that you might overflow with praise and with thanksgiving, and something bubbling up from within you that wants to give glory to God. When the church is not overflowing with the Holy Spirit, dear friends, then we come up with a substitute. Turn to Revelation 3, verse 14. Revelation 3, and verse 14. All we need in, don't we? 
the church in Laodicea, Revelation 3.14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds. God knows our deeds, dear friends. God knows what we're doing. God knows all about us. Amen? Where can we go from His Spirit? Where can we flee from His presence? Is there anything that we haven't thought or said this week that God doesn't know about? Is there anything that we've done behind closed doors or in the dark that God hasn't seen? No, God knows. God knows our deeds. And He knows that we're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, and I've become wealthy, and have need of nothing. What's the problem with this church? They don't see that they have a need. Dear friends, do we have a need? Yes. What is that need? We need the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? And the day we stop saying that we need the Holy Spirit, be sure of this, we make our Saviour sick. He would want to spew us out of his mouth. The day that we say we have need of nothing, that we become rich. And the worst spiritual state to be in is not to be dead. It's not to be cold. It's to think that we're all right when we're blind and wretched and naked. We're not clothed. And when we think we're all right, are you clothed with power today, dear friends? Because we are naked without Him. It is the promise of the Father. And we should be as shamed and embarrassed not to be clothed with power on high as to walk out of our houses with our clothes on. Because it is the promise of the Father. Are you clothed? This church doesn't realise it's naked. What a tragedy. <clears throat> what a tragedy. There was a man in the Old Testament, reading through Samuel recently, a man called Saul. It's one of those accounts that you read it and you think, what on earth? Have you found any of those? There's a good few. Well, Saul, he starts off well. He starts off well when he is small in his own eyes. Are you small in your own eyes today? Do you realize what you are? Because if you don't, I'll tell you later. <laughs> this man is all right when he realizes he's nothing. But something goes wrong. Because he was never God's chosen king. And when he gets exalted and God uses him and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, things start going wrong. It is all right for a while, but he's not ready for it. And he goes from thinking that he's a nobody and he's a nothing and he starts thinking he's somebody. And then the Spirit of God comes upon him and what happens? He prophesies. But he prophesies naked. God warns that church in Laodicea what? That if you don't repent, the shame of your nakedness will be revealed. Who did that happen to? Saul. 
He's the Old Testament example of that. Do you understand? The Spirit of God came upon him. He prophesied, but he was naked before the nation. It was there for everyone to see. Something wrong with Saul. He started off all right when he thought he was little in his own eyes. I don't know how much you know about church history. I'm not an expert by any means, but there was a revival in Wales at the beginning of the 20th century. If you ever go to Wales and you travel around, just have a look at the dates on the churches. There's church buildings everywhere. Especially in North Wales. Go, go, go on to the, the, the um, Anglesey, the island of Anglesey. And just drive around. At the end of every road there's a church building. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Anglesey, anybody? Mm -hmm. Look at the dates on the building. They're all the same. Within a couple of years, they are all the same. They were all built at exactly the same time. Why? There was a revival in Wales. And about that time, two young men, <clears throat> the Jeffreys brothers, George and Stephen Jeffreys, were both saved in the Welsh Revival. They were, they were from a mining family. I think they were both miners, actually. I think they both worked down the pits. God moved, God saved them, and then God baptised them with the Holy Spirit. And then God started to use them. And amazing things happened through these two young men. Oh, who weren't that young but The Elim movement <clears throat> came out of George Jeffries, primarily, and others. He was one of the ones, the first ones that God used in an amazing way. And Stephen Jeffries was an evangelist, the, the other brother. They saw amazing miracles. One of the things that characterized Stephen Jeffries' ministry was that and cripples would come in and be healed. <clears throat> People completely riddled with arthritis, osteoarthritis, bent over double, and, 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 and he would pray for them in the name of Jesus, and these people would straighten up and be healed. And they'd go walking and leaping and praising God. And many things were done through these men. But something went wrong. Because Stephen Jeffries went from being that, that hopeless case who was a minor, who was nothing, and he started travelling the world. He went to America, he went to Australia, and he went down to South Africa, and, and God blessed him. God was doing amazing things, saving thousands of people, and he began to think that he was something. And Stephen Jeffries stood up in pulpits in South Africa and said, what more can God do for me? What more can God do for me? He became rich, famous, wealthy. Stephen Jeffries forgot who he was. And God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. His ministry declined, his health declined. And you know where he ended up? Back in Wales, totally crippled with arthritis, osteoarthritis. His body all crumpled up like, a, you know, what it does to you, so that he couldn't straighten out any of his joints. George Jeffries went wrong doctrinally, seriously wrong. There's a warning, dear friends, when we start to think that we're something and that we have need of nothing. Dear friends, we always need him. We always need him. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, page 1961. The Holy Spirit not only does amazing things through us, Second <clears throat> Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 says, verse 8 chapter 1, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline, of a sound mind. What is he, the Holy Spirit? He is the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, of discipline. God gives us freedom. The Holy Spirit brings a freedom. The Greek word is parousia. I think we've looked at it a number of times. A freedom of speech. We need it. Don't we? The opposite of parousia is phobia. Fear. Why don't we speak out? Why don't we testify to all around us? Why don't we go into all the world and preach the gospel? Phobia. Isn't that true? Fear. The opposite of fear is parousia. Who or what brings parousia? The Holy Spirit, dear friends. He's not the spirit of timidity. He's not given us a spirit of timidity. If you are fearful of speaking, if you are fearful of sharing your faith, if you are fearful of going out and making Jesus Christ known, do you know what you need? It's not an it, it's a him. The Holy Spirit gives us parousia. It's not that we'll never be fearful, but we have the power by the Holy Spirit to overcome fear. So we still know what we are, we know that we're nothing, but the Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome and to freely speak. We won't get tongue-tied. The Holy Spirit will give us utterance. He will give us the words to say. He'll remind us of the scriptures. He'll help us to speak clearly. Do we need him? Yes. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of power. We need liberty. We need freedom of speech. We need that in our preaching. Our making known of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need that in our worship, dear friends. We need that in our prayer meetings. Amen. There is a liberty, a freedom that comes by the Holy Spirit. A freedom of speech that is the opposite to phobia. And the, the early church realized that that's what they needed. Turn to Acts chapter 4. Persecution had started that tried locking up the apostles and they were trying to silence the church. They commanded <clears throat> they commanded Peter and John not to speak any more in the name of Jesus. And they released them. So what did they do? They held a prayer meeting. When you are threatened, dear friends, and you're told not to speak anymore about the Lord Jesus Christ, what should you do? 
Keep your mouth shut. Better do as I'm told. No, dear friends. You should pray. You should get down before the Lord who created the heavens and the earth the one who has all authority, and what should you seek him for? Parousia. Lord, I'm in danger of phobia. It's my natural tendency. And so I need one who can give me the opposite of phobia, which is parousia. I need boldness. And boldness comes by the Holy Spirit. So give me <coughs> boldness because I'm in danger of phobia. <coughs> and that's what they did. And what did God do? He filled them with the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, do we need him? We need him. Because without him, the enemy will shut up the church. What is the perfect demonstration that the church in Britain is almost devoid of the Holy Spirit? There's no preaching, almost no preaching of the gospel. There is almost no witness no gospel witness in this nation. Why? Because we are not filled with the Holy Spirit. We are not empowered from on high. Because if we were, no one would shut us up. Not the very powers of hell, not the authority, not the government, not anybody would be able to shut us up when we have that boldness which comes by the Holy Spirit. We must obey God and not men. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We need to be able to give an account for the hope that is in us. And we should seek to be equipped with the scriptures. Nothing wrong with that. But all the fine sounding arguments in the world are not going to win one soul for Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1. Paul says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. I had a problem. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but what? But in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Paul saw that even though he had a far superior intellect to any philosopher on Mars Hill or anybody else, he could have argued them into the ground and beat them at any debate. And not one one soul. And he determined that he would not do that by superiority of speech. Who was he looking to? He knew the only way that men and women would be saved was by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a good lesson to learn, dear friends. Otherwise, our witnessing and our proclamation of the gospel just become a series of very good and very clever arguments. We need him. Turn to Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Couple more things before we close.
What else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit leads us, dear friends, as the sons of God. Read from verse 12, Romans 8. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For all who have been led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. But you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. What kind of spirit is he? It's not a spirit of fear, is it? It's a spirit of adoption. That as sons of God we cry out to our heavenly Father. And he leads us, dear friends. Without the Holy Spirit, the church becomes an organization of committees. That's the truth. When the Spirit of God is not filling His people and filling the church, the church becomes an organization and men take over with committees. We are supposed to be a spiritual house being built up into the head which is Christ. And the head should be directing the body. Amen? Mm -hmm. But to be that, dear friends, we need to be filled with the Spirit. So that we are led with the Spirit. But we don't have to do that, do we? We can have some committees instead. We can have a few votes. We can decide what the best way is forward. We can get together and have some committees. God forbid, dear friends, that we should organise the Holy Spirit out of the church. Isn't that what we do? Isn't it? And why? Because we don't want to get on our knees and seek the Holy Spirit, seek the empowering from on high and admit that we have a need and that need is God himself. There's always a substitute, but it's never a good one. No direction, no power, what else? No fellowship, dear friends. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. When the Holy Spirit came upon the believers, verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Fellowship. What is fellowship, dear friends? It's sharing. Sharing what? We should be sharing what God is doing in our lives. We should be sharing the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We should be telling one another what God has done in our lives. What God has revealed through the Word of God. How God has answered our prayers. The very life of God that we have seen manifest day after day after day through the week. We should be coming together to share that. But when the Holy Spirit is not filling us and controlling our lives, we've got nothing to share. So we can talk about the football results. Or we can moan about the government. Or we can talk about a whole number of other things. Because we've got nothing, really, to share of the life of God. Dear friends, fellowship is people filled with the Holy Spirit getting together to talk about what God is doing in their lives and through their lives. Amen.
I want to close with a few scriptures. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. There are very few things that are in all four Gospels. You know that? Very few things in all four Gospels. Quite a number of things in the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke, but very few things in all four Gospels. So we should sit up and take notice when we find them. Matthew chapter 3, the verse 8. John the Baptist says, Therefore, brood of vipers, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. I am not fit to grovel about at the Lord's feet. There's a man of God, dear friends. Don't hear too many of those, do you? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And verse 6. And John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. His diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying after me, one is coming who is mightier than I. I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Verse 15. Now while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he might be the Christ. Is this the Messiah? Who is he? The prophet? John answered and said to them, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one who is coming is mightier than I. I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. I wonder how many times he said that. Dear friends, we need to say it every day. If only Stephen Jeffries and George Jeffries had got up in a morning and said to themselves, I am not fit so much as to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John's Gospel, chapter 1. You'll never work out what this scripture is going to be. <laughs> Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus come into him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who is higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. And John bore witness, saying, I beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. The Lamb of God does what? He baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He takes away the sin of the world and he baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And one last scripture, Acts chapter 1. 
Acts chapter 1. I read from the first verse. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God and gathering them together. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Dear friends, we need to be empowered, we need to be baptized we need to be clothed, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Without Him, your life will go wrong and the church will go wrong. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.